Oh. Did you catch the dog, Tom? Oh, you're muted. Hi. Buddy. Welcome. My name is Beth Keen, and I'm the CEO of Holocaust Museum LA. Thank you for joining us for our annual Teichholz Holocaust Remembrance Film Series, the only film festival in Los Angeles dedicated to Holocaust films. Our film series integrates films with panel discussions of renowned historians, filmmakers, and survivors, and is moderated by noted journalist, author, and son of Holocaust survivors, Tom Teicholz. This summer's film series, which focuses on documentaries, is supported by the Consulate General of the Federal Republic of Germany and the Greenland Family Foundation. Founded in 1961, Holocaust Museum LA is the first survivor founded and oldest Holocaust museum in the United States and houses the West Coast's largest collection of Holocaust era artifacts. Our museum's work is more critical than ever given the fragile state of today's world with the war in Ukraine, humanitarian and refugee crises and the alarming rise in hate crimes and rhetoric in this country. Holocaust Museum LA's mission is grounded in teaching students and visitors the critical lessons of the Holocaust and its continued social relevance, empowering them to speak out and stand up against hatred, bigotry, and anti-Semitism. We strive to build a culture rooted in kindness, empathy, and treating people with respect. Film is a great medium for seeding interest, increasing knowledge, educating, and raising difficult questions about the Holocaust. Holocaust Museum LA launched the annual film series in the summer of 2016 through the support of the Teicholz Holocaust Remembrance Film Fund. The fund was established by Tom Teicholz, who has written extensively about the Holocaust and the Holocaust in film. Tom's parents were both Holocaust survivors. His father was a resistance leader who helped to save Jewish lives after the war. His mother had been an actress in Hungary. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for the panel discussion on the film Pizza in Auschwitz, where survivor Danny Hanach retraces his steps during the Holocaust with his adult children, with the intention of spending a night in his old barrack in Auschwitz-Birkenau. The intergenerational film straddles history, black comedy, deep heartache, and the relationship between trauma and resilience. We are pleased to welcome our panelists this evening for what I'm sure will be an informative discussion. Professor Helga Schreckenberger is a native of Vienna, Austria. She joined University of Vermont's Department of German and Russian in 1986 and has been the chair of the department since July 2009. Her recent course offerings include Taking Flight, Tales of Exile and Migration and People of Color in German and Austria. She teaches courses in Holocaust studies, including the texture, of Memory and the Legacy of the Holocaust, which examines identity and the second generation. I also have the privilege of introducing my husband, John Keane, who has been involved in the documentary film world as a director, producer, since the release of his feature film, Swimming in Auschwitz in 2007. In April of 2018, John released the documentary film After Auschwitz, chronicling the lives of the same six women from Swimming in Auschwitz but beginning on the day of liberation and focusing on the most common question audience ask, audiences ask of survivors, what did you do next? After Auschwitz was released by Passion River Films and AMC Independent and played theatrically in over 40 cities across the United States, as well as internationally garnering a perfect score of 100% fresh on the review website, Rotten Tomatoes, and meriting inclusion on various best of 2018 film lists. When not working on film projects, John serves as a two-term elected member of the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District Board of Education. It's now my pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's program, Tom Teicholz. Thanks, Beth. And welcome, uh, both John and Helga have been uh, part of our uh, panels before, and I'm uh, really uh, delighted that you're joining us again to discuss Pizza in Auschwitz, which is a, um, uh, in many ways, uh, uh, unusual uh, documentary. Um, it's a film by Moshe Zimmerman, uh, Danny Hanuk, uh, a survivor of many camps, who has gone back several times 
uh, but never with his grown children, finally gets his uh, adult children, uh, Miri and Sagi, to uh, agree to go with him. And uh, together in a van, they traipse across um, from Vilnius uh, to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, and it's a dysfunctional family <laughs> uh, adventure um, that uh, I think it's going to be very interesting to discuss, uh, particularly in the context um, of them all being uh, Israeli. Um, but I wanted to begin with the fact, with the facts, which is that um, Danny uh, Hanok was a teenager in Auschwitz and Birkenau. And I wanted uh, first to begin by asking you, um, Elga, about uh, sort of the context of uh, the experience uh, of a child uh, there. Yes, I mean, uh, you said that Dani is very unusual for surviving several concentration camps. It's even more unusual that he survived as a young man, as a teenager or as a child. Because if you look at the numbers, uh, the odds are very, very, very much against him. So it has been now established that among the uh, 1.3 million people who were deported to Auschwitz, there were approximately 232,000 children and young people up to the age of 18. And um, of those children, 216,000 were Jewish, uh, about 11,000 Roma and Sinti, 3,000 Polish, and the rest came from the Soviet uh, region. Um, of the 232 children, only 23,500 were re uh, registered in the camp, which means that more than 200,000 didn't even enter the camp. They were murdered upon arrival, so they didn't make it to the selection process. And of the children who were registered, only 4% were Jewish, so roughly 8,600 uh, Jewish children of the 216,000 who were deported to Auschwitz even made it to the camp. So these numbers are staggering. Um, so then it did make it to the, to the selection process and it is not clear what the criteria for the selection process were. Uh, we don't know what the age uh, standard was or what the standard for height was, but we know uh, that generally uh, the, the more hardy you look, the fitter you look, the more suitable for labor you look, the better were your chances. And we also know from stories from Elie Wiesel, for example, that um, the children who were entering the selection process were often advised by the people who worked there to, to lie about their age, to make themselves older. And we also know from Dani uh, and from Ila Wiesel, Elie Wiesel, that younger children were usually murdered upon arrival. So I think that's the context that we have to realize that, that Dani's survival really is nothing yeah. short but a miracle. Yes, and, and, and yeah. you're right, it is it's staggering. Uh, you know, and when you, when you have numbers that big, it's um, hard to really uh, just think of the individuals who, if 200,000 people, if you line them up, it would just go on and on and on. Um, uh, now, Danny, uh, in this film, we see a lot of his personality, which is quite aggressive, domineering, um, and he has also a very dark sense of humor. He describes himself as having a BA, which is a bachelor's from Auschwitz. He describes himself his, uh, as having his pediatrician, having been met at Mengele, that, that that was his childhood doctor. And, um, and he's quite rigid in how he wants things to go. Uh, and we see the problems with that throughout the film. Now, I wanted to ask you, John, having uh, made two documentaries about survivors, um, what was your experience in terms of their personalities? And did you look at, feel a sort of glints of recognition in seeing uh, 
how uh, Danny, um, you know, conducts himself. Yeah, there's certain there, there certainly is. And again, we, we generalize because we're talking about hundreds of thousands of survivors. So we tend to generalize. Um, and it, watching this film with Danny reminded me why I tend to work with female survivors, because you don't see this personality as often. But it is a personality that I've come across, which is that idea of look what I did. Look what I I showed them. And even says it in the film. And even says like, um, you know, I, I showed those bastards. You know, it, it, his, his entire remembrance of the experience was just one of, I, I did it, I showed them. There's no emotional connection. It's almost like everything shut off. And now that he's out, there still is no effort to make that connection around. So he's a difficult topic for a film because he really, you talk about the, the, the personality. The personality is one note and it's incredibly strong. And then we talk about humor. There was a lot of humor in the camps. He never references that. He uses it almost as a cudgel in his conversations. And it's difficult for me to even call it humor because usually in humor, there has to be some kind of connection. We, we, I'm making fun of myself. I'm, I am chopping down the hierarchy or I am, you know, there, there's, a, there's, there's none of that with him. And the example I'll give, there's a great story of uh, my wife Beth was at the museum the other day and a survivor from Hungary came in and there was a new picture up on the wall of the barrack in Birkenau. And she comes and she goes, oh, look, my bedroom. That's funny because it, it's her. Um, but with, with Danny, the, the humor goes beyond that where he talks about, um, the BA made me chuckle. But then as he starts making those little jokes to the waitress in Poland, you know, maybe there was some German SS, maybe there's some Nazis, they know what happened to my parents, ha ha. And he, it's almost like he's lashing out at people through what's supposed to be humor. And you see his children just, and the only way his, I'm rambling now, but the children, the, the phone call when, when, when the, the daughter sits on the phone by accident and pretends she's calling Hitler. That's one of the only times father and daughter are engaged on the same emotional level because she's playing his game. So it's a very, his humor to me is just from just such a sense of shutdown or pain or whatever you wanna call it. I am not a therapist, but as a filmmaker, it's, it's so extreme that it's interesting, but it would be very difficult to pull more out of him because he's just and so rigid. Th th thanks, John and, and Helga. Um, we, we've talked now about Danny. I want to talk about his children, his adult children, Miri and Saggy, because this is as much a movie about them and how they um, deal with this almost uh, PTSD, this uh, intergenerational trauma that's been visited on them. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, as uh, John said, we always speak in generalizations and, you know, there is not one experience uh, of uh, one surviving experience. And there's also not one experience that uh, is common to all children of survivors. But there are certain commonalities that have uh, been detected when uh, these children came into adulthood and started to uh, communicate with each other and found out that they're very distinct group. And that sort of happened in the 70s when uh, most of the children of survivors entered adulthood. And I, I just remembered, uh, just want to remember Helen Epstein's book, Children of the Holocaust, yes, of which was actually the first book that articulated those commonalities among the children of survivors. But um, uh, the, uh, the experience of the parents had a very, very um, intense effect on the life of those children, the way how they uh, look at the world, the way how they define their own identity and the way how they um, yeah, interact with, with other people. And uh, it, it's been discovered that it didn't matter if the parents were like Danny who has, uh, uh, talk to his children incessantly about his experience or uh, other examples where the parents do not talk about it. 
it didn't matter the children of the Holocaust survivors that they were always aware of the parents' experience as long as they can remember. And uh, then, as you called it, the intergenerational um, trauma uh, is, uh, is one of the commonalities that has been detected. Many of the children do show symptoms that we associate with post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, they have nightmares. Uh, they are um, irritable, and but it also had a positive effect of them. They're very resilient. They're adaptable. Um, they uh, are very tenacious, and uh, but they also feel like their parents. You know, either uh, it, uh, the parents have a lot of expectations of uh, of them that they want them to fulfill it. If, uh, a particular role that they want, that they sh that they have to be strong, and Mary articulates that the most. You know, she talks about how her father always wanted them to be strong, and he says it too. And then uh, another thing that that Mary uh, articulates is what uh, is that um, the Holocaust imagery was always present for her, and in the way how she she really. Um, identified herself. You know, she talks about when she hears knocking at the door, she thinks it's the Gestapo. Or when she goes in a, wall, in a forest, she thinks she will be um, chased by the Nazis. And uh, if you look at the literature, you always have this, this Holocaust imagery. If you think about um, Spiegelmann, you know, he, he has this image of the gas coming out of the shower heads or um, uh, uh, Helen Epstein, when she stands uh, and looks at the subway, they turn into the cattle, the the the, the, the uh, trains that bring that deport the Jews to Auschwitz, um, and being named for one of the Holocaust um, uh, victims, Miri, uh, you know this this idea that the children of the Holocaust survivors are the memory candles, memorial candles uh, that have to carry on the legacy, that have to you know, that, that have to carry uh, the burden of, the, of, of those who didn't make, or who carry on the destiny of those who didn't make it. Those are all um, symptoms that many of the, of the children of the Holocaust have in common. But oh, uh, yeah. Uh, th thank you. Yeah. I, I, I feel uh, as a child of survivors that now, uh, I should send you a check for this therapy session because <laughs> I'm now understanding myself so much uh, a deeper in a deeper way. Um, but um, um, what I thought, you know, when I chose this film to as part of the series, what really struck me uh, so strongly was its, you know, that it's its transgressive nature. You know, rather than the way survivors are sort of portrayed as like saintly, you know, persons and, and uh, the way their children are portrayed as dutiful, you know, dedicated children. This is a whole, you know, other reality um, uh, where um, the father is incredibly aggressive the daughter is incredibly resistant. The other son is incredibly avoiding everything, you know, uh, escaping into his religious liturgy and prayer. And, um, and I thought to your point, Helga, uh, and also to your John, that um, to have a more complete view of the survivors and the children as human beings, uh, this film uh, adds to it uh, by presenting this, you know, sort of what I think is somewhat transgressive portrait. Uh, uh, John, what did you think? Yeah, it's an interesting way. Transgressive is a, is a very good word to put on it because I wouldn't have come up with that. I found this... I I found this film. That, that's why I get the get the small bucks. Because to me, it was almost abusive. I, mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of second. I mean, so it's fascinating to hear Helga talk about. You know, everybody carries grief. Everybody carries trauma, intergenerational trauma. 
I just wonder how we talk to second generation, third generation matters, as opposed to the fact that we talk to them. Um, the way he was interacting with them, it doesn't seem like there was ever uh, explanation or ever any sort of welcoming, let's have a discussion. It was like, I don't know why he brought them on this trip other than to show them, to prepare them for their own Auschwitz. It, it wasn't paternal. It wasn't a connection, emotional connection. It was just dragging them along. Look what I did. See what I did. So I. It was, also, his it was way very, or the highway, right? Which? His way or the highway. He had an idea that he needed to, in a sort of compulsive fashion, go through. And of course, you know, uh, uh, he couldn't really do that. At the end, he kind of has to give up and say, okay, this was enough. Um, uh, Helga? Yeah, and, and even, like, I'd love to hear Helga's point on this too. Like, you look at two children, and you mentioned you've got one who is terrified when there's a knock on the door, and another who was retreated into a, a deep Orthodox Judaism. And it's like both children have gone to such polarized positions yep. because of this cudgel of a parent, whether you can even call it a parent or whether you could say it's a, it's a child who never developed emotionally past his trauma. I see it a little bit different. I see that there is, despite everything, despite this, uh, resistance that Miri has. She deeply cares for her father. And not just because she feels guilty. I mean, she's concerned about his health. She's concerned that he's actually, you know, getting himself sick by getting so excited about what he needs to do and what he wants to do. Uh, she's critical of him. She, uh, she, you know, she admonishes him about uh, Sagi's uh, security, that he lets him go to this German town as, a, as an Orthodox Jew, not ever thinking how uncomfortable this might be for him. Uh, but she, she is also able to really articulate her feelings to her father and saying, you know, this is wrong what you are doing. And for me, uh, I mean, the most gripping scene in the film was when he says, I do not understand you. Right. And she says, and I don't, we don't understand you, but be happy that we don't understand you because if we understood you, it meant we would have had the same experiences. And do you want us to have those experiences? And that was such a right, but but such an point. emotional moment. And I also think she did get through to him because he. That's when he said not. I, yeah, I, I, you know, it's like we'll never know it. And you're right. That idea of no one who lived it will ever understand it. Um, mm -hmm. So therefore, we can't engage in it. But for him. The price of admission for him was understanding. He says to the person, the filmmaker, did you ever survive a children's selection? No, no one did. You know, you, you said one in 25 did on, on that yeah. day. No one, but that's the yeah. price of admission. No okay. one understands him. And there is love coming from the children. I agree with you on that, but no one can, no one can meet his standard. I also thought one of the interesting aspects of this movie is that it's an Israeli film. Mm -hmm. And I think that in some ways uh, within the uh, narrative and mythology of Israel, uh, post Holocaust, there was this notion of the new Jew, the tough Jew, the it's Jew who, true. no, right? And I think that Danny Hanak is in part representative of that. And Miri is, well, first of all, Sagi, the religious Jew, is representative of that strain of Israeli life, right? The, the, the religious observant strain that flooded into and that Ben-Gurion gave, gave special privileges to in order to allow them to thrive in Israel. And then you have Miri, who to me represents the contemporary Israel that we um, see engaged in today's complicated Israeli politics. Um, so I think there's an aspect of that at play in this film too. There's a, it, it's funny because again, we'll generalize with Israelis. There, there's a survivor who is one of the founders of our museum, Freddie Diamond. And Freddie, when he moved to Israel after liberation, 
they started a kibbutz for survivors. What did they call it? Kibbutz Buchenwald. And that was that, we're here. Yeah, we can take Buchenwald where we want. We own it now. And the other people were like, didn't we have enough in Germany? We have to have more Buchenwald in Israel. You know, it's like that right, attitude, right. like, look, you, know, you puff so, up. And this brings us to the scene in the movie that no one really can get over. Um, uh, which is the scene where where uh, Danny has a confrontation with the administrator of uh, Auschwitz Birkenau. Now, before we we actually discuss that, I know John, you filmed there, and you had your own interaction with this same uh, uh, person. So tell us about that. Yeah, I so I, I the first time I filmed in Auschwitz was in 05, and the same lady was in charge of the filming. And let's remember, they're less than two decades removed from communism. It was not as popular to be there. And it just started coming in vogue. Um, and they were just very driven by forms. You filled in a form and you turned your form in, you were allowed to do X, Y, and Z. They didn't really care what you were doing as long as you filled the forms in. And I was furious at one point when they tried to start charging me this, that, and the other. But I got mad at my translator and just said, <laughs> they should be paying us to come here to film. So I understand why Danny, but the, the extent he took it to was so uncomfortable because I knew that this woman was merely doing the job she was supposed to do. John, tell people in the audience the, about the scene because I, we, I didn't oh, So it, it's a scene where so Danny comes to Auschwitz Birkenau out of film. He's in the main camp Auschwitz where the offices are. And he was expecting to be there and film in his barrack at night. He wanted to sleep in the barrack in Birkenau that, he's, that he was kept in. So he goes to the offices in, in, in the main camp and they were expecting him two hours later. Seems like not a big deal, but in that, at that time, at that place, it's a huge deal. So he got furious when they didn't allow him to do whatever he wanted because of the tattoo and he showed it. And it, it reminds me of a story at the 50th anniversary of the liberation. The, the Jews were kept outside the gates of the main camp, survivors. And my friend Renee was there inside trying to scream to survivors of, of Auschwitz are trying to come in and you won't let them in. And the little woman who was in charge said, Madame, Madame, we are only following orders. <laughs> At which point Renee loses it. But the, back then Auschwitz was not what it is now where you have Polish people who are dedicated to remembering what the camp was and preserving it. I, 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 felt, I, I felt so uncomfortable for this woman who I also, had wanted to yell at. I, I, I felt that she was, that that, I felt that that was not fair how, how they did that. To walk in with a camera and film somebody without their knowledge and then to attack her in that way, it had nothing to do with Polish culpability. It, it, was, it was really uncomfortable as a filmmaker to watch that. And as someone and, who works and, in education and Holocaust. And, and to your point, John, his, his, what he was saying was, here, look at my number. This is my reservation. Right. right. I should be able to sleep here because I have this. And you, and, can't, and you can't argue that. You can't argue the, the, the raw emotion the survivor has coming back there. But it was so displaced onto this woman. Just because she's Polish. And again, I'm not, like, I'm not sitting here saying, oh, the Poles had no... I'm not doing that. I have had issues with the, with the new regime in Auschwitz now. Where, they, where they're trying to change the history a little bit and how they talk about things. Like outside the, the fences, oh, here's where the Polish farmers helped Who's prisoners. The no, they helped, they, helped, they helped Gentiles. They didn't help Jews. No one helped a Jew in, in Birkenau. So that was, an that was a tough scene. It yeah. was a tough scene. It was uncomfortable. And when she started to cry, I did feel bad for her. And I had wished that maybe... Uh, the scene could have been edited a little bit. Um, but on the other hand, I could also understand this. You need to fill out the form. And this is, you are, you are supposed to be here in two hours. And no, we are not flexible. And no, we don't understand. Right. We are following the rules that for somebody who has heard that as the justification for what, uh, some of the people in the concentration camps did to the uh, to the prisoners. I could see how that could would just make him um, explode yep. and be uh, as 
uh, unpleasant as he was. So I can see both sides, but I, I also understand. Um, I, I also felt very, very un, um, comfortable. But on the other hand, I mean, she was going on to sing, we are not animals. Yes. Yeah. And, and that, you know, you treat us like animals. And that really also struck me as completely ironic. You know, how can you say that in that situation when you know what was going on in that camp? How can you make that, you know, how can you, I mean, where the prisoners were not regarded as humans, they were regarded as animals. And he, because he is upset about her not, not being more flexible, treating her as an animal, that, that also made me feel, made me cringe. You know, at, that, at that time, it was different to film there. Like they yeah. never asked me what I was filming. They just said, pay the 340 bucks for the, the permit. And then they want to charge me each day another 340 and you have a guide go with you, pay them $80 cash or $60 cash. If you go there now, they, they have rejected projects coming in. I was filming there with a project that they rejected that I then had to bring academic support in to show why this is a worthwhile project. It, it's a very different, but it's exactly what you said. They completely, like Danny shuts off from the emotion, yeah. the people running the camp had completely shut off from emotion and they're just doing their job. Yes. And they forgot where they were. <laughs> yes, exactly. They forgot where they were and what happened. They right. couldn't yeah. make that, that connection and to realize how insensitive some of the and, things And I can't imagine he was the first difficult survivor to, to yeah. arrive there. I, I looked it up. So he's on the phone. He's talking to a man named Yarek Mensfeld at one point, who was a historian and an author at, at, at the camp at that time. And Yarek, I, I went online to see what he was up to. And there's a YouTube clip of him talking about himself being berated by a French survivor. And he said it was so horrible for him, but yet he understood. And he understood yeah. that this is what this woman had to do. And this was in 2001 or 2002. And this is a man who is so emotionally in tune and so connected to the history, but yet he was he was berated merely for being Polish. So, so um, I'm going to now uh, turn a little bit to the questions. Uh, a lot of the questions that we've re received ask um, whether um, I know what happened to uh, Danny or his family or even the filmmaker, and regrettably, I don't. Uh, um, um, if um, uh, if someone at the museum knows, perhaps they'll post it. Yeah, I I couldn't help you with that either. I will say one thing though. One thing that I, when the first time I filmed in a, I think Tommy froze. Hopefully, I'm still here. I, I think uh, the first time I filmed in Auschwitz, we I, I felt so uncomfortable there. We couldn't eat or drink inside the camp in Birkenau. I would leave the camp gates to eat or drink. I felt so watching this man in his barrack eating a slice of pizza was just like, oh, you know, it was so jarring to me. But again, he's the survivor. He can do whatever he wants in that space. But it was just, it was so odd, jarring to see it. Yeah, I do not know what happened to the family either. I, um, it, it's interesting in the credits, it says that Miri actually wrote the text and narrated it. So, um, so, so actually, she she must have played a much bigger role in 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 how the the movie then was finished, wouldn't you think? It, it was. It, it seemed to me that she they brought her in to do the narration since it was her own narration. I don't. And yeah. again, I don't know if she's a writer by trade. It yeah. made sense to have her do it. Um, yeah, I noticed that as well. I'm curious. How, uh, uh, Tom was coming back here. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. I I I must have hit the wrong button. Well, Tom, we solved everything while you were gone. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> I feel much better now. Uh, um, let's see. Let me look look at the Q and A. Uh, <laughs> someone says it was one of the worst films I have ever had to watch, and someone else also said that they were going to turn it off several times, but stuck with it. You know, I, I'd like to speak to that because I understand that feeling. And, you know, my adjective for this film would be worthwhile. I think this was a very worthwhile film. I, I, I've seen most images of atrocities that you could imagine from genocide in my filmmaking career. And yet this was so difficult 
for me because of the pain that the daughter, I mean, the son is a turtle. The son is a turtle in his religion, my religion. But the daughter, like Helga says, is trying so hard to care for her father and connect with the father. And it's, it's just not there. But yet she tries, she keeps trying. So it was, it was exceedingly uncomfortable, this film, in, in a good way. Yeah, really, and, I, and, I, way. and again, I felt it's, it's not the film you usually see, you know, when you do a Holocaust film series. And I thought it was uh, uh, um, worth showing for that. Um, Helga? I also found it very difficult to watch. And um, maybe I'm a little bit more forgiving uh, of Danny than, than John is because I felt a lot of pain and anger in this man that he has suppressed because he, he wanted to be strong and he wanted to be the survivor and he wanted to triumph at the end. But there is all this unresolved pain and anger that I don't and that I don't think he ever was able to to really uh, admit to. Yeah, I, and, I don't. Do, I, and, and behind all this this activity and this energy, I I was watching it with my twenty year old daughter, and she said, "My God, how old is this man? Look at the, how he runs and how strong he is and how you know this um, this this." energy that that seemed to uh just drive him on that that screamed pain to me the, the daughter says it so well in the film i didn't write it down so i don't have the full quote but she says we can't get mad at him because he's already suffered so much and i agree right. i can't get mad at danny i look at him i just say, i wish i wish i could ask you to communicate in a way that invites us in as opposed to pushes us away and makes us feel guilt or burden I think we do better when we teach Holocaust to younger generations where we find ways of bringing them into a conversation. And I think survivors, it's healthier too. I find that a lot of survivors who don't like to talk about their history will do so if you talk about things that are human. Talk about mm -hmm. times you helped somebody. Talk about a time somebody helped you. Don't mm -hmm. talk about the pain and suffering. Yeah, but I also feel that we seem to have this need to worship the survivors and to, to make them into heroes. And then if they don't behave like heroes, we are unhappy with them. I mean, you know, if you think about Arch Spiegelman's mouth, I mean, some of the things that he, he shows about his father are not very flattering. And when, we, when I read that with my students, they're upset about it. Uh, and they- Exactly. They almost, yeah, they almost feel like it's a betrayal. You know, this man has suffered so much and how can he be so critical of his father and so not understanding. And I think we need to realize that this has, what those people have experienced has consequences and they are not, uh, they are Absolutely. not, yeah, I mean, Ruth Kluger said it, nothing good came out of, war, of Auschwitz. Okay. Yeah, we, we should not try to say, well, you know, it was in some way worthwhile because it I mean, wasn't. Gruber, Gruber said it, but Berenbaum said it too, which was yeah. the, the Holocaust was an absolute evil. Don't try to find yeah. nuance in it. But, yeah. but, but, but Helga, first of all, this is fascinating too, because we bring in Tom as a second generation survivor, me as just a Jew in America, married to a third generation survivor, and you as someone born in, born in Vienna. It's fascinating to get the triangle um of all that going on um I, I just think that at a certain point danny is the parent um he's a parent of two children and i'm looking at it as a parent and i'm like i just i wish there was some way to help him communicate with his children and to be the parent in that situation and so i'm not looking at it as like i you know you need to act in a certain way because all survivors must act no i mean he can act any way he wants and I'm not judging anything he says or does because of what he's been through. I agree with the daughter, but at some point you have to be a parent. If you're with your children, you, where's the, what's the role? I, and I don't know the answer to that. Like, I don't know why he took them on this trip. I, honestly, I really don't know why he took them on this trip other than to just show them where he was and show them what he did as opposed to what they could take from it. Like you said, you don't understand me. I don't understand you. This trip doesn't change that. But they, but but they spent time together. Would. Listen, uh, he needed to enact this 
piece of him with his children. He had experienced it himself. He had gone back to reunions. He had commemorated it, but he had never uh, had, had this experience uh, that he imagined clearly, specifically, uh, with his children. And I think, um, I, I understand that need and that compulsion, um, uh, but obviously, um, I also appreciate the ways in which it could not happen as it happened as he wanted it to happen. Like you say, he needed, he needed, it's definitely yeah. true. And you, you look at one of the one, the, one of the true moments of warmth that is not around dark humor, and I'm not even gonna call it humor, one of the true moments, he needed something to connect him to the past, something to bridge his life before the Holocaust and his life after the Holocaust to make some sense. And when the daughter found that little piece of dried up leather, that, that little piece of leather was so, because she found it and brought it to him. And that in some way brought the generational shift together. It tied together his worlds. And yeah. that little, that had such meaning to him, I think. I agree, that was also a very interesting scene in the movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then of course the movie ends, as someone pointed out in the questions, with, um, uh, with Danny dancing with his wife, which, you know, uh, uh, on the one hand could be, you know, a filmmaker's way to sort of end things. But on the other hand, I thought was also sort of um, uh, indicative of Danny's going on he's just he's just pushing on his way dancing in his own driven way he defeated those bastards his right. words his words not mine i defeated the bastards yep he's dancing yep, yep. that's his joy yep. well that's listen fun. i think that's a good place to end uh, <laughs> our conversation uh, I want to thank you, Helga, for for, for uh, sharing with us your your insight and uh, uh, knowledge and uh, your reactions to this film. And John, also thank you so much for participating uh, and bringing your uh, your experience and your filmmaker's knowledge. Um, I want to let everyone who's watching know that we have one more film in this series. Next Tuesday, we will be screening and discussing. Um, uh, one survivor remembers the Gerda Weissman story uh, with the filmmaker Carrie Antelis and Professor Michael Berenbaum, who John referenced earlier. And um, this is the was the completely. Um, some people have asked if they can still watch this film. Is the link still live? I believe it is still live for the at least for another seven, 24 hours. Thank you. And um, uh, the. Uh, uh, One Survivor Remembers was uh, an HBO film and the first uh, Holocaust related documentary that became part of the permanent collection of the Library of Congress. So we'll uh, he talk all about that. And uh, again, um, I want to thank our uh, sponsors and supporters, the uh, Leo and Rita Gre Greenland Foundation, the YNS Nazarian Foundation, the Richenthal Foundation, the Davidson Hooker Foundation, and all of you who have participated and uh, made contributions to this film series. Good night, enjoy your evening, thanks, bye. Thank you, good night. Good night. Thanks for having me.